I came up with this. Um, there's actually a video on, whoops, on my YouTube channel, which is 10 tips to live better. I was trying to think, what are 10 tips that you could do very easily? It doesn't take a lot of work here. These are easy things that you can do to live better. Move around and play. So basically, you know, get outside. If you have kids, take your kids outside. Play with them. You know, get outside, move around. Move around at work. Don't sit so sedentary all the time. Get up, take breaks, stress less. Do things like yoga, breathing techniques, meditation. Um, catch some Z's, get some sleep. Most people are not getting enough sleep. I'm not getting enough sleep, but I have an excuse. I have an eight month old daughter and a five year old son and a cat. And the cat wakes us up too. So try and get more sleep. Naps are good. I try and get naps wherever I can. It helps to be a chiropractor because I have that table in my office. So I can just, you know, oh, I've got 15 minutes here. Shut the lights out, have a little nap. It's fantastic. Let nature nurture. We're losing our connection to nature. As I said earlier, this has been proven time and time again in research that just by walking in a forest or in a natural setting, like I live in the beach, so I go down to the water and we just stare at Lake Ontario and it's like, how can you be stressed when you're just looking at water? It's amazing. It has a calming ability. Hello, sunshine. Get out in the sun. Regardless of if you're getting vitamin D synthesis or not. So even in December, if it's a sunny day, try and get, like at your lunch break, go outside, get in the sun. It'll help your mood. You'll feel better. Humor is very important. Try and laugh lots. Decrease processed foods. Buy foods that don't have many ingredients. If they come in a box, they're probably not good for you. Drink more water. Speaking of, and decrease your screen time and increase your FaceTime. I'm not talking about FaceTime on the iPhone. I'm talking about face-to-face -face with real humans. Imagine that. We're starting to lose that ability. Like, oh, I'll just send a text instead of going and talking face-to-face -face with this person. We need FaceTime. Biohack number 11. We're getting near the end now. How many of you feel low energy throughout the day? I would think most of us have moments, right? Where you're like, oh, so tired. What do you do? Go get a coffee. I don't drink coffee personally. I drink tea. I love tea. But I'll give you another solution. Instead of drinking coffee, exercise. If you exercise more, you actually build more mitochondria. Okay, mitochondria are a cellular organelle that is responsible for giving you energy. It's a very, very important component of your cells. And when you exercise, you make more mitochondria. So I know this slide's hard to see here, but basically what we have here is muscle fibers. This is a cross section, so we've like cut through, let's say, someone's bicep, and we're looking at um, muscle fibers right here. In between would be a little bit of adipose tissue, which is like fat. And then these little tiny dots here, those are mitochondria. Okay, so this is someone who doesn't really exercise. And this is someone who does exercise quite frequently. What you see is a little more hypertrophy of the muscle fibers. So those are bigger. You don't see much... Um, adipose tissue so there isn't very much fat there and what you see is larger and more prevalent mitochondria so there's more mitochondria in someone who exercises if you want more energy throughout the day then start exercising as you will build more mitochondria and you'll have 
more oxygen. Uh, you'll be more efficient with oxygen, basically, when you're breathing. And you'll have more energy. So it's a natural biohack that you can do. So I tell my students whenever I ride my bike in, because it's about 8 to 10 kilometer bike ride, and I have the shoes that have the clips on the bottom that clip into my pedals. That way, when you're pedaling, you're not only getting the downstroke, but you're getting the upstroke as well. Have you ever thought about that? So it's more efficient. So if you're clipped in, it's more efficient. So when I come to class, sometimes it's almost like I have tap shoes on. It's like tick, tick, tick because of the, the little clips on the bottom of my shoe. And, and then I tell them, oh, I was just busy doing mitochondrial biogenesis. And they're like, what? Like, that's what exercise is, mitochondrial biogenesis. So you're making new mitochondria. You have that ability. Everyone does. So try and harness it. And as far as exercise goes, there's two, the research shows there's two really good ways to do this, to increase your mitochondrial density. And that is short, high intensity intervals. So let's say, go on a rowing machine and go as hard as you can for two minutes. And then just rest for a bit. And then do it again for two minutes, really hard and then rest for a bit, maybe do it three to five times. And it doesn't have to be a long exercise session. You could, do the, you could do all that in 15 minutes, and it can be good for you. So you don't have to exercise for an hour. You can just do like 15 minute bursts here and there. Or you can do a very long distance. So for those marathon runners out there, they also get um, they also increase their mitochondrial density. But for me, I would prefer to do 15-minute bursts instead of a two-hour run. And that makes more sense to me. So whatever works for you, do it. What biohacks are you going to try? Have you thought of a few while I've been talking? I'll leave that for you to consider. So what biohacks are you going to try? This is the uh, actually treated Patch, the founder of Good Life, after he ran, I think he ran the 10K portion of the Toronto Marathon. I used to volunteer at the Toronto Marathon and treat the racers afterwards. Any questions for me before we set you free on this nice day? Yes. So the question was, for the blood test, do you have to ask specifically for these things to be tested? The example was platelets. For blood tests, generally speaking, they will check platelets as sort of their base um, fundamentals there, or the base scan. I'm not entirely sure if they do. I feel like they do, but I'm not entirely sure. But definitely for things like vitamin D, you do have to ask for that. If you don't ask for vitamin D, they will not check for that. So very good question. But the other things like the cholesterol, things like that, um, in order to get that, you do need to fast. So they may not do that either unless you ask specifically for cholesterol, triglycerides. And in that case, you'll have to fast for, I believe it's 12 hours before you get that blood test. That's a great point. So the question was, how do you take a good nap? What are sort of best practice? Uh, I think this is kind of an individual thing, but I'll tell you what works for me is I do, I call it the power nap, and I do 20 minute power naps. And it's to the point where I've done this for so long. I did this all throughout university and I still do it, that I'll set the timer on my phone for 20 minutes. I'll, I'm in my office, I just shut the lights off, draw the blinds, lay down so it's nice and dark. I think I fall asleep in about 30 seconds. Like I'm, it's usually in the afternoon, you know, around 2, 3 p.m., right when you're crashing. That's usually when I'll do it. So I fall asleep really quick and it's got to the point where I've done it so many times 
that I will wake up about five seconds before my alarm goes off. So it's like my internal clock is so trained for 20 minutes that I'll just wake up naturally at 20 minutes. Sometimes, if I'm very tired, I will do the snooze thing. I'll do like another 10 minutes. But the reason I limit it to about 20 minutes or 30 minutes max is your sleep cycle goes in different, well, different cycles. So I believe it's about 40 minutes. If you sleep 40 minutes, now you're starting to get into the really deep sleep. So if you have a nap for, say, 50 minutes, and then you wake up, you're going to be so groggy, and you're going to want to go right back to sleep. So I think that's where it's probably best to have shorter naps, and that's my own personal experience. I don't know exactly what the research says on this, but for me, 20-minute power naps work really well. Not to say I always wake up fully refreshed and ready to go, but usually within about 10 minutes after waking up, I feel great. Good question.